popping, brand new whip, I got options. Hey, what's happening? It's your boy Moses, Moses Uvier. Yo, coming to you live and direct on the screen. What's up, man? I hope y'all doing good. Um, yo, a little bit about me. I'm the uh, middle school pastor here at Irving Bible Church. Been here about, for about five years now. Um, yo, uh, another thing about me is that I am a creative. I love to do things and all things creative. So I'm currently working on a book right now. Uh, I write poems. Um, I write raps. I shoot music videos, I've shot in documentaries, I've acted in a few commercials and TV shows. Um, yeah, I just love doing all things creative. And um, one of my favorite foods in the world is uh, lemon pepper chicken wings from Wingstop. You can't just get lemon pepper chicken wings from anywhere, you gotta get it from Wingstop. Um, but if you get the lemon pepper chicken wings, you gotta get the fries with it. And if you get the fries with it, you got to get lemon pepper on the fries. That's the jam. Trust me. That was a, that was a, that was a bar for you. Take that with you. Trust me. It goes hard. Um, but look, the most important thing you need to know about me, Cuddies, is this, is that I am married. Um, I am a husband and a father. I'm a father of three. Okay. So my oldest daughter, um, she's 12. My oldest son, he is seven. My youngest daughter, she is 10 months. And I'm a little tired. So if I sound a little frazzled, it's because she kept me up last night. Um, for some reason, she wouldn't fall asleep. And then I had her running around a little bit. And then all of a sudden, I saw her grunting in the corner. Checked that diaper that she had poop in there. As soon as, I, as soon as I wiped her booty, got that poop out, boy, she went straight to sleep. She was out of there. So lesson to you parents out there. If your baby can't sleep, they probably need to poop, okay? So what I do is I laid her down. I, I started moving her legs like a bicycle. Got them bowel movements all loose. And then boom, she let that thing drop it. She dropped that thing like it was... I don't got to say the rest. I know you said it with me. I know you said it with me. Anyways, uh, let me tell you a little something about my wife. So, me, if you could define me in a phrase, I would say that I am the definition of making it out the hood and being washed by his blood. That's how I would say that I am, okay? But if you had a phrase to define my wife, she is the definition of order. <laughs> she loves having things in order. And so one night I decided to be proactive because I knew she was cooking dinner. So um, I said, hey, you cook dinner, I'll wash the dishes. So she cooked dinner. I went to wash the dishes. And then as I was washing dishes, I decided to put the dishes in the dishwasher. Okay. Um, but then afterwards, I started hearing some clinkety clanging in the kitchen. I go and check and she's reorganizing the dishes that I put in the dishwasher. And I'm like, little mama, what you doing? Like, I just did this. And she's like, yes, but you didn't do it the right way. And I was like, what? I was like, it doesn't matter. You're just washing the dishes. So we started going back and forth. And then we needed to reconcile because we was getting kind of heated. Because I'm like, look, you're trying to tell me what to do. And she's like, look, you got to do things a certain way. And so we have come to an agreement. And that agreement is this, that I will wash the dishes and put the dishes the way I usually put the dishes and she will come back around and reorganize those dishes, okay? But the reality is that conversation got kind of intense and we had to reconcile to one another. So let me ask you this. What does God say about reconciliation for relationships in your life? Let's pray. God, we need you. We need you now more than ever. God, I need you. Help me to articulate your word. Lead me and guide me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm gonna run through this pretty fast because Camille said you only got 15 minutes. So I gotta do what she's telling me to do. Shout out to my big sis, by the way, Camille. Thank you for letting me be on here. Um, it's, I'm, great, I'm grateful and honored. Um, so Matthew chapter five, that's where we're gonna be at. We're gonna be in verse, we're gonna see verses 21. We're gonna see verses 38 through 42. And then we're gonna see verses 43 through 48. Okay, but we're gonna be in Matthew chapter five. I'm not gonna read everything, so I'm gonna try to summarize it really quick. And let me recap some of these verses. So here's where we're at. You've heard it was said that you shall not murder anyone. And anyone who does murder is subject to judgment. But I'll tell you that if anyone is angry with a brother or a sister, they'll be subject to judgment. All right, 38 through 42, it says this. You have heard it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, you turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone sues you and tries to take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. What is God trying to tell us about reconciliation in this passage? He's trying to poke right at your subconscious. 
He's trying to poke right at your heart. He's trying to go to the secret place where you make all of your choices. See that phrase eye for an eye, it used to mean, yo, you give me $100, I'll give you $100 back. Yo, you take a bag of chips from me, I'm going to take a bag of chips from you back. But now Jesus came, he revamped the law, and he said, look, we ain't on that no more, okay? We ain't on that. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, you need to give. What do you need to give? You need to give that other cheek. If someone wants to sue you and take your shirt, you need to give. What do you need to give? You need to give over your coat. If someone says, hey, I want you to walk a mile with me, you need to give. What do you need to give? You need to give him two or three miles. So what do we need to know about this? That when it comes to reconciliation in our relationships, that us as people that are children of God, the way that we are identified by who we are is in the manner in which that we give to those that we may think that are lower than us, that we may think that are on our level, and that we may think that are above us. It's about giving, always and frequently. Verses 43 through 48 says this, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Woo. Let me stop right there. So this passage is, is, is creating an identity for us. It's saying that when you do this, you are children of your Father in heaven. And so it said that, yo, you could love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was acceptable back then. Jesus came, he died, he eradicated the law, and he said this, I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So what does that mean for us? That means for people that we might have problems with, that we might disagree with, that not only are we to give to them, but our Father who is in heaven identifies us by the way in which we give, by who we pray for, and by the things that we do. Hear me on this, by the things that we do. See, that word righteousness is also in this passage because it says it rains on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So what does that word righteous mean? That word righteous means to make things right. And I've said this to some of my homies before, but it's interchangeable with the word justice, okay? Righteous and justice, same word. And the meanings are this, to make things right in the world and to do things right in the world. So giving righteousness is to make things right. Giving justice is to do things right in the world. That is how God is able to say, these are my children. That's how he's able to distinguish us from the crowd. By who we pray for, by who we give to, and by the things that we do. So, so what do we do? So now, so now how does that connect to where, where we're at today? And so let me take you to Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 18. I'm in the NIV. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to read this small little passage. It says this in verse 14. For he himself is our peace. He has made the two groups one and has destroyed the banner, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside his flesh, the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Okay, what is Paul talking about here? So Jesus dies, he comes on, he comes back to life. He's on earth talking to all the homies. sees Dalton Thomas, sees everybody. He says, hey, I'm leaving y'all the spirit. He tells Peter, you're gonna build the church. And he's like, bye. And so then during that time, Paul comes, he gives his life to God. So now Paul's noticing something. He's noticing that there is beef between the Jews and the Gentiles and that they both believe in Jesus, but they're not rocking with each other, okay? And so now the first act of reconciliation after Jesus leaves the planet was bringing these two groups together. And Paul was reminding us and was reminding the church. These are church folks, by the way. He was reminding these church folks that when Jesus died, that he put to death the dividing wall of hostility. That when he died on the cross, he did not only take our iniquities, he did not only take our shame, but he took the dividing factors that divide you and I. 
so that we can be brothers and sisters. So the reality is, in that environment, when we eradicate this hostility, it creates this culture of grace where we can be able to let each other make it when we, when we mess up. And that grace is cultivated with our faith. Our belief in Jesus creates this environment of grace. And then that grace is what leads our homies and our family members to salvation. And remember, that word salvation, it means to be delivered from sin, to be delivered from ruin. So the question then is, what is the purpose then of salvation? What's the actual purpose of giving your life to Jesus? A lot of people will tell you, well, the purpose is for you to make it to heaven, brother. As long as you make it to heaven, you're Gucci. That is not the only reason why Jesus died. The purpose for salvation was for good works. Like I mentioned to you guys, that we're identified by being children of God by the things we do, who we pray for, and, and how we make things right in the world and do things right in the world. So the question then is, okay, Moses, so what are those good works that you're talking about? The good works are to bring in the Jew and Gentile together, to bring the Democrat and Republicans together, to bring the Donald Trump fans and the Joe Biden fans together, to bring the Blue Lives Matter people and the Black Lives Matter people together. That is our job as believers in Jesus. So if you are on one side or the other and you are not advocating for people in the middle, you're not advocating for people to come together and reconcile, then I have to question whether or not you believe in Jesus. Because this text literally says that he came to put to death hostility. He came to put to death the dividing wall. It's very important that we recognize that when it comes to reconciling each other, reconciling our differences with one another, is that as Christian believers, we have the answers. We have the answers to change the hostility that we are seeing in our world today. But if you take in one side or the other, then how are we able to distinguish that you are a child of God? So you may be saying, Moses, look, I hear you on that, bro, but my heart ain't there, man. I need help getting my heart right. Look, I got you. I'm going to give you seven things, and then I'm going to bounce. I'm going to give you seven things you need to do to help you cultivate a heart posture to help you develop a movement towards reconciliation. Because we got to remember that we were at one point in time, Gentiles, far from God, not connected to who he was. But he sent his son down with the hopes that you might reconcile. With a maybe. He sent his son down on a maybe that you will say, hey, I'm sorry, God, I'll come back to you. Okay? So here's how we do it. Number one, we have to identify and recognize this. That when the Bible tells us to love our neighbor, that neighbor is everyone. Not just our white neighbor. Not just our black neighbor. Not just our Donald Trump loving neighbor. Not just our Joe Biden neighbor. All of, our, all of our people are our neighbors. Anyone that is, has skin and has flesh, they are our neighbors. Two, we have to recognize that Jesus died for everyone. Not just Christians, not just Republicans, not just Democrats, not just Facebook lovers, not just Instagram lovers, everyone. He died for everyone. Three, we need to start holding each other accountable. Listen, I got biased. I'm a pastor and I preach this stuff and I still got biased in me. I need y'all to hold me accountable for my actions because I'm expecting that you being my brother or you being my sister in Christ, that you will approach me with love, care, and, and, and value my dignity. But we need to be holding each other accountable. That's what the value of being in community is. We're not just hanging out with each other to make each other feel good. We need to be hanging out with each other to lead each other to be more like Jesus. So we need to be held accountable for our actions. Number four, we need to pray for those who persecute you. Ooh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. And so for my partners who say, okay, I don't know what that man, word persecute means, you know what I'm talking about? That sounds like a $100,000 word. Don't worry, I got you, player. I got the definition right here. The definition is this. Someone who is 
curating hostility, causing ill treatment, especially because of their race or political views or religious beliefs. So in other words, in order for us to create a heart posture that leads us to reconciliation, we need to pray for those who victimize us. We need to pray for those who mistreat us. We need to pray for those who are causing punishment to us. We need to pray for those who are causing tyranny to us. We need to pray for those who are causing affliction to us. We need to pray for those who are causing torment to us. We need to pray for those who are torturing us. When we do that, it brings your heart peace and love and leads you to a place of reconciliation. Number five, not only do we need to pray for those who persecute you, but we also need to love your enemies and pray for them as well. So for some of us who may have these weird feelings towards these political parties, you start to now create enemies with these people. Guess what? God is calling us as reconcilers, as people of his, of his lineage, as his children, to love the Donald Trump people and to pray for them. God is calling us as reconcilers, as his children, to love for our Joe Biden lovers, to have love for them and to pray for them. Number six, we need to abort. We need to abort any level of hostility in our hearts. For example, you might, see, you might, you might be the person that's voting, voting for Joe Biden and you might not be liking these Donald Trump people. And then you pop up on your Instagram and a Donald Trump person says something kind of wild, you automatically want to get mad about it and type something real quick to him. I need you to abort that feeling. That is what the word of God is telling us to do as people that identify themselves as children of God. Abort that. It's sinful. You know, for me, I have to abort the fact that there are some people that may say some things that are derogatory and racist towards me. I have to abort the fact and assume the best of them. I got to do that too. It's tough, but it's true. It's gospel. And final thing, number seven, we need to speak up. There are people in our lives right now that are suffering and that need your voice, that need your value, that need your input, and you sit in back with all this knowledge about God, with all this understanding, with all this love and care that you can give, and you're not saying nothing. And because you're sitting back, that is starting to create a place in your heart of selfishness. And I want to challenge us to fight against that so we can be able to cultivate a heart of, a heart of reconciliation. So let me say them again. Our neighbor is everyone. Jesus died for everyone. We got to hold each other accountable. We got to pray for those who persecute us. We got to love our enemies and pray for them. We need to abort any level of hostility and we need to speak up. Let us not be a people that just talk about these things, that just wish for our world to be better, that just wish for all the negative things on the internet to just go away. Let us be a people that go out and do. When Jesus left us with the Holy Spirit, he left us with the ability to build the church and to build people up and to, and to encourage people and to create environments and places and safe places for people to be and belong. So let us not just be a people that talks about these things, but let us be a people that goes out and, and does something about it, that starts doing, that starts bringing action, that starts bringing love to the world. Thank you guys for your time. My name is Moses. I appreciate y'all. Peace.